All right. Hello, everyone. Can you all hear me well? All right. Uh, my name is Xiaoyan Sang, and I am the Electronic Resource Librarian at the North Carolina State University Library. And on behalf of the NACIC Continuing Education Committee, I'd like to welcome you to our February webinar, Joining the Library Profession, presented by Christy Fisher, Kimberly Lawler, and Maria Collins. So before the presentation, I have a few quick announcements. First, the webinar will be recorded and we'll post the webinar recording on this website. Second, if you have any questions for presenters during the presentation, please enter them into the WebEx Q&A box located at the lower right corner of the WebEx window. If you can't see the Q&A box, click on the Q&A icon in the upper right corner of the WebEx window. The Q&A box will then appear in the lower right corner. The presenters will answer your questions at the end of their presentation. And finally, when the webinar is over, we will be you will be redirected to a survey about the webinar. I hope that you will take a few minutes to fill it out and let us know how we are doing, what we can do better, and share ideas for future webinars. And with that, I will introduce our speakers for today. Um, all right, Christine Fisher is is this the head of uh, technical service for the university libraries of the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, where she has worked for 12 years. She has ex experience in acquisition, serials, and reference in public and private academic libraries, as well as hospital and government libraries. She is a co-chair of the North Carolina Serials Conference Planning Committee. Kimberly Lawler is the e-resource and serials acquisition specialist at the University of Colorado Boulder. Tim Burley received her bachelor's in history and foreign language, German from the University of Northern Colorado, and her master's in library information science from the University of Denver. Currently, Kim Burley is an active member of NISIC, serving as a chair of the Student Outreach Committee and as an ambassador to four different library science graduate programs. Kim Burley has presented at both the Colorado Aliens Library Assessment Workshop in 2015 and the Alex Exchange in May 2017. She also won a NASIC First Timer Award for the annual conference in 2017. Kim Burley is interested in the areas of information resource management, serials, acquisitions, licensing, e resources, and the access and discovery of e resources. Maria Colling. Maria is the head of acquisitions and discovery at North Carolina State University Library and has served, has served in various capacities at NCSU for 12 years. Prior to her work at NCSU, she worked as a serials librarian and a serials coordinator at Mississippi State University Library. In both these roles, she was involved with hiring and onboarding numerous library related positions. So both professional, paraprofessional and professional, and has over 17 years of management experience. She is a current editor-in-chief for Serials Review and has published in the areas of electronic resource management, open access, and workflows. Okay, uh, we will now turn things over to our presenters, and Christy Fisher is the first one. Hi. Thank you, Yan. All right, here you go. Thank you, Yan. I appreciate that. Uh, I'm sharing this information about the value of regional library conferences, partly in my role as one of three co-chairs of the North Carolina Serials Conference, which holds a one-day conference each year in Chapel Hill. The conference is presented by the North Carolina Central University School of Library and Information Sciences. It might help for me to define my approach to the term regional conferences. I'm excluding the big national conferences like the American Library Association Conference and ACRL. These can include your local area up to neighboring states or provinces, and several of my examples will be from within North Carolina. A general conference would potentially include all kinds of libraries, public, academic, K-12, 
special libraries, archives, government libraries, any kind of combination of those. And for example, the Azalea Coast Library Conference includes libraries from southeastern North Carolina. The NCLA Biennial Conference covers the whole state. Another opportunity is a conference that focuses on specific types of libraries or related organizations, such as law libraries or archives. The North Carolina Serials Conference is an example of a conference that focuses on a special interest. It might attract librarians, staff, and graduate students from a variety of types of libraries who work in a specific subject area or with a particular patron population. East Carolina University holds the Librarian to Librarian Networking Summit for K-12 um, media personnel. And finally, there may be groups within neighboring states that gather for conferences. Here are two examples, one for folks in technical services and one for medical library personnel. There are several reasons for attending regional conferences. They include smaller attendance, more reasonable travel distances, and a chance to attend a conference when a big national conference could be out of reach logistically or financially. When you consider attendance, at a regional conference, don't feel that you need to stay exclusively within your local area. I expect that you'd be welcome among any group of conference attendees since librarians are generally very open and friendly. To find ideas for conferences of potential interest, you may want to check the library conference planner at this link. Your, school, your library school may share announcements about conferences or your state library association may post information and you can certainly do some online searching as well. As you look at conferences that you might find educational and useful to your professional development, you may be inclined to check the conference website to see whether they have a code of conduct which is designed to set up expectations that there will be no harassing behavior exhibited by attendees or speakers. The North Carolina Serials Conference developed a code of conduct. After a librarian we hoped to have present our keynote explained that she would not be able to attend without one in place. The planning committee agreed that we needed to write one, post it, and be committed to enforcing it. Since that time, I've been noticing more and more conferences setting these up. With all the activities and demands of being a graduate student or someone new to the profession, it can be difficult to make time to consider attending a regional conference, but there are a number of reasons to take opportunities if you're able. They offer in-person professional development opportunities where you can learn about new and innovative practices and new technologies and tools. You'll have the chance to network with all kinds of people who work in libraries, archives, and media centers, depending on which conferences you choose to attend. And you may get ideas for research or projects of your own. Before you go, you might want to see if there are volunteer opportunities, and some conferences will offer the chance for first-timers to be assigned a conference mentor. You wouldn't need to spend the entire time together, but the mentor could give some helpful hints about navigating the conference, and maybe you could plan to meet for a meal or a chance to be introduced to some other colleagues in the field. There can be financial incentives. A travel scholarship may be available for students, first-timers, or simply someone who doesn't have institutional support. Oftentimes, registrations are discounted or waived for students, and organizational memberships may be available for students, too. You may also want to present. Presenting at a conference shows you understand the importance of professional development and creative activities. It's good to be able to include presentations on your resume as you seek employment. It's also a great opportunity to develop a paper you've written or a project you've conducted and to share what you learned with the broader library community. You can present on your own or with others. There are typically a range of options for sessions, including full sessions, panel presentations, which would include a moderator, lightning talks, which are short five to 10 minute presentations grouped together, and poster sessions, which are more informal and involve attendees talking with you in a shared space with others who have created posters. There are even maybe a special category for students, and that could be helpful as a newbie. What you learn at a conference can be beneficial during the job search process since you will be aware of innovations and trends in the field. You might get ideas on places to apply for jobs and you'll see the kinds of positions that are available. You'll be better prepared for a job interview 
by knowing what issues might be brought up in questions from the search committee. The conference may also offer a student track. At the North Carolina Library Association Biennial Conference last year, they had a track for students that included help with resumes and cover letters and job seeker advice. I re recommend that you let people know you're a student or a first-time attendee. Your name badge may even come with a ribbon that identifies you. Meet with the vendors. If the conference has tables or booths for vendors, you can talk about products and services, learn what is new, and pick up some fun and useful swag. If the conference runs more than a few hours, you can perhaps meet with fellow attendees at the conference reception or chat at a coffee shop. Some conferences offer dine around and that's where you sign up to join a group going to a restaurant together with each of you paying your own way. A conference may offer opportunities for writing. Some conferences invite attendees to write a conference session report, which then gets published in a journal. In case of the North Carolina Serials Conference, those reports are published in Serials Review. And as you were told by Jan, Maria is the uh, editor-in-chief for Serials Review. Charleston conference reports are published in Against the Grain. If you give a presentation, you may be able to write it up for the conference proceedings. The Brick and Click Libraries at Northwest Missouri State University has online proceedings. You could write up a blog post. One library colleague of mine recommends submitting a write-up and photos from your conference experience to your alumni newsletter editor or your library association news editor to see if they'd like to publish it. And while attending the conference, you may want to tweet about sessions. Thank you, and I hope you get a chance to attend a regional library conference. Now for Kimberly. Hi, my name is uh, Kimberly Lawler, and um, as Jan said earlier, I work at the University of Colorado Boulder in Boulder, Colorado. I'm the e-resources and serials acquisition specialist, and I'm here to talk to you about NASIG and how NASIG supports student career success and why all students that are a part of different library and information science programs should be members of NASIG. One, it's free, um, but I'm going to show you um, and tell you about some ways that we support them. Um, currently, I am the chair of NASIG Student Outreach Committee, um, and I've been a member of NASIG since 2015 and started volunteering for NASIG Student Outreach Committee um, in 2016. I won one of the first-timer awards that NASIG um, awards to people um, to attend the annual NASIG conference, which covered my entire cost to attend, which was really helpful last year. And since joining NASIG as a library and information graduate student in 2015, um, and then maintaining my membership after graduating, I can attest to the different ways that NASIC supports student career success, and some of these ways include its student mentoring program, the student spotlight sessions at the annual conference, and the different types of committee work students can be a part of, um, and also the different continuing education resources that NASIC offers. The NASIC Student Mentoring Program is designed to provide a year-long opportunity for networking and professional development between NASIC regular members and NASIC student members. The program includes an orientation, mid-year virtual session, and monthly facilitated discussion questions between the mentor and the mentee. Mentors and mentees discuss their expectations and needs up front at the beginning of the program. For mentors, it's an opportunity to give back and help student members grow in the field while also learning from their mentees. And then for mentees, it can be an opportunity to learn from an active professional. Some additional things that mentees can gain from this program are exploring career options, demonstrating a dedication to professional development, and acquiring skills, attitudes, and relations that they'll need to become a library and information professional. Both the mentors and the mentees um, <clears throat> excuse me, are supported throughout the entire program by the Student Outreach Committee, and these are, and the committee members are available to answer questions um, to help make both, um, both the mentors and mentees as successful as possible. Uh, the whole process starts with um, the mentors and mentees filling out an application, and a call for this is going to be going out soon, so be on the lookout. Um, 
the student outreach committee will then pair the applicants um, together based on their areas of interest and some other different um, things that are in the application. And then the program will officially start with the orientation at the annual NASIC conference in June. All the applicants must be NASIC members, but like I said earlier, it's really great for students because membership for students um, to NASIC is free. After the annual conference and orientation, the Student Outreach Committee will email the mentors and mentees a monthly question for the pair to discuss. Some examples of the questions that can be asked during these times are, what tips do you recommend for successful work-life balance? What are your professional goals for the coming year and how will you meet them and others? And then in the middle of the student mentoring program year, a virtual session such as this, um, like we're doing right now, will be put together for the mentors and mentees by the um, Student Outreach Committee. And this will include a presentation virtually allowing for mentors and mentees to engage in real time with um, different types of presenters and allow for discussion. Um, currently, uh, the Student Mentoring Program is going to be finishing up its pilot year in May of 2018, so in the next couple months. And I've had the opportunity to help the Student Mentoring Program um, as being a member of the formation committee and then also applying and being accepted as a mentor in the program. And so um, as I attended the NASIC annual conference last year, I was able to attend the in-person orientation and that was really great because I got to meet with other um, mentors and mentees that were accepted in the program and that were also at the conference. So I got to um, also learn about um, the program in the sense that the orientation provides uh, the expectations and goals of the program, um, what it means to be a mentor and mentee, and where to go for support during the whole program, whether it's at the beginning, middle, or the end. And then um, the orientation will also be available virtually for those that can't attend the conference in person. So if you cannot go to the NASIC annual conference, don't be afraid to attend or to apply for the mentoring program because you'll still be able to see the um, orientation. Um, my current uh, mentee lives in the Denver area, which is really lucky, um, and is attending the same library and information science program that I attended. So I'm really glad that I was matched with her and we have been able to meet in person um, when we've had the time to answer our monthly questions and have an even um, bigger and different discussion about the library and information science field and what type of work I'm doing, what she's doing, what she's learning, what I'm learning, and it's been um, really great. And otherwise, when we can't meet in person, then discussion happens over the phone or over um, email. Um, for the pilot year, the mid-year virtual session included two different presentations. The first presentation was given by newer professionals in the library field, and the second presentation was given by a librarian that had a lot more experience. Um, and this was a great way to get different perspectives, tips, knowledge, and also allow for discussion from the mentors and mentees. And then all of this information that I'm giving you right now can be found on NASIC's website, and I've put links in my slides so you can just click on the URL um, and go to those uh, web pages. Uh, the NASIG Student Spotlight Sessions provide opportunities for students to get practice presenting at a conference, um, just like Christine had mentioned earlier. So the presentations allow students to showcase what they are learning, experiencing, and working on during their time as library and information um, science students. And some additional ideas that they can present on um, are highlighting research projects or thesis, um, workflow problem solving ideas, or other topics that could be of interest to the NASIC community. Uh, the link on this slide goes to the student proposals from the 2017's annual conference, so from last year's conference, and some of examples of titles of presentations that those students presented on are the quality standards of serials, unboxing ILL, dynamic partnerships between resource sharing and technical services, acquiring e-journal, e-resource content for patrons, a review of recent practices, and a um, another presentation was investigating perpetual access. Um, participating in these student spotlight sessions gives students the opportunity to showcase their ideas, any work they've been doing, answer questions, network, and meet professionals in the field. And it also looks great to add to their resume. Um, in addition, attending NASIC's annual conference allows students to experience what um, a library conference can consist of. Uh, being a part of NASIG and being a committee member and a subcommittee member has been um, really great for myself because it has given me a wider perspective into the library and information um, field and the specific work that I'm currently doing. And um, 
the committee work that I've completed so far and in the last year or so and participated in has helped, um, helped me in my career, I believe, and I truly appreciate that my previous supervisor encouraged me to volunteer um, to be not only a member of NASIC but to be on a committee and work on a committee. Um, I've interacted with more library professionals and students um, than I ever would have if I was not on a committee for NASIG, and um, the committee work has especially helped me personally with networking, and I've even learned how to use a couple of different technologies, like using um, WebEx, as we're using right now. Um, I really appreciate learning from the different committee members, and my co-committee members have taught me a lot about what other NASIG committees are doing, how to contact them for certain things, and how NASIG is sort of run. Um, and I've found that open discussion and feedback thrive. And the best part of committee work for me is working on a project or task um, with my committee members and then seeing the finished product once we've completed it. So this can help, um, being a committee member can help students learn new skills, network, and be in the know about what's happening with NASIC in the library field. Um, so just real quick, my current committee, the Student Outreach Committee, is responsible for fostering relationships with library and information science programs, um, which is including recruiting new members to NASIC, promoting NASIC awards and, and the conference, and then also guides the NASIC ambassadors that contact and do outreach to the library and information schools. I um, mean, there are so many other NASIC committees that are great opportunities opportunities for students to join, such as the Communications Committee, Conference Planning, Evaluation Assessment, the Mentoring Group, and Program Planning. So there's lots of opportunity for students. And um, I've added um, the URLs, again, to this uh, for both the Student Outreach Committee page and the list of, for, to have, that has the list of all the NASIC committees. Um, and another example is the Mentoring Group, and that group is designed to help make the new conference attendees feel more at ease. They highlight membership benefits, and they create um, great networking opportunities. Um, and before the annual conference, a call goes out to NASIC members to sign up to be a mentor, and then they're paired with first-time conference attendees. And, and I actually got to participate in that last year, and I thought that was really great, meeting somebody that had a lot more experience um, and going to the conference before because they had never been to NASIC's conference. And then in addition to the um, different opportunities NASIC's programs and committees offer, um, NASIC offers different continuing education resources um, for NASIC members, and this includes webinars, core competency documents, and references for different um, resources that are online. Um, so like today, NASIC offers both free and discounted priced webinars for NASIC members. Um, some other webinars that they've offered in the past um, include tracking down the problem, the development of a web scale discovery workflow, how accessible is our collection, performing an e-resources accessibility review, um, the Counter 5 release, um, an introduction to Sushi, um, and also an academic and writing academic writing and publishing webinar, and there's a lot more that they offer. Um, in addition, uh, NASIC also has core competency documents that were created by NASIC core competencies task forces during research and discussion on um, scholarly communication librarians, e-resource librarians, and print serials management. And these documents basically describe core competencies Again, based on their discussion and research, and it, um, the e-resources one, for example, provides, um, it describes core competencies for serials and electronic resource librarians. It provides librarian educators with a basis for developing curriculum um, with a specialized focus. Employers can use the competencies as a basis for describing these specialized positions and establish criteria upon which to evaluate their performance of those who hold them. And so this document also complements ALA's core competencies core competencies for librarianship. So there's just an example of some of the documents that NASIC has on the website for its members and for, um, uh, for this field. And then lastly, NASIC provides reference resources for, for serialists, and so those include um, different resource categories like general resources, acquisitions, cataloging, licensing, open access, um, standards and best practices. And so the URLs for these different categories and some brief descriptions are available on NASIC's website. So as you can see, if you click on um, reference resources for serialists, it'll lead you to that page from my slide um, if you don't want to go right to NASIC's website. So um, with all of these different resources, NASIC continues to support student career success. And um, which is a great benefit for NASIC members, especially students. So um, I really appreciate your time, and thanks for listening about the different ways NASIC supports, um, again, students' career success while in their library programs and beyond. And I'm going to hand it over to Maria. All right. 
Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Maria Collins. I'm the head of acquisitions and discovery at North Carolina State University Libraries. Um, I want to give you a heads up that I have a chest cold. <laughs> so there's possible that throughout this presentation, I might have to pop in and out to cough and that kind of stuff. But um, just so you're one, you know, give you answer your question about why I have such a funny voice today. Anyway, I want to begin. Um, um, by providing a brief intro about what my portion of the session is and what is it, it, what it is not. Um, um, this is going to represent what I look for as a manager of a technical services department. So based on years of experience hiring and developing new librarians in the field. So I'm not representing the personnel librarian perspective. My perspective is also influenced heavily by the culture of the places I've worked, um, Mississippi State and North Carolina State University. Um, and my thoughts will also reflect the shifting landscape of technical services work and what I believe to be the kind of person that can thrive and help shape a future um, in a technical services environment. Um, during my presentation, I'm going to talk about knowing yourself. So understanding yourself and the organization uh, to which you're applying, attributes of a successful um, hire. Um, I'll provide a few tips for the interview, as well as some additional considerations for new career librarians. <clears throat> so first, let's start with knowing yourself. Um, as you begin your work life as a library professional, you'll want to reflect on what makes you happy and productive at work. So do you like lots of structure and support with instructions and clear guidelines? Are you at your best when you're making up the rules and have a lot of freedom? Do you have a production mindset where you love to get lots of stuff done or are you more of an analytical thinker and problem solver? Would you prefer a smaller, more intimate setting where you might be able to do a little bit of everything? Or are you okay with larger environments where you might specialize in the type of work you do? Also, you'll want to think about the level of engagement you're interested in across the profession. Would you like to write professionally, serve on committees, or um, help out with different professional organizations? There really are, is no right or wrong to any of these questions, but evaluating what you want and need from a job will help you to evaluate your cultural fit, your fit with that organization that you're trying to apply for. <clears throat> the next section um, is an overview of the kinds of things I look for when hiring a new librarian. So these characteristics have proven to be fundamental to success of librarians and technical services where I have worked. Note that almost no one has all of these things and that certain qualities are definitely more appropriate for um, some positions um, more than others. <coughs> so the most obvious ability for most of us to recognize when assessing a new hire is domain knowledge, or essentially the skills of the trade. So we're talking about what you know about acquisitions, electronic resource management, cataloging standards, so forth and so on. Often new librarians may not have years of experience to demonstrate their knowledge. So assessing aptitude for growth in that knowledge area is also really important, especially for these entry-level positions. So candidates should readily relate examples from any relevant life experience that reflects the skills needed for that current position. <clears throat> Having the right knowledge for the job is pretty much a requirement for getting the job. However, in technical services areas, such as serials and ERM, <clears throat> knowledge is often just a, a first step in the engagement process. It's also important for folks to frame their knowledge within the context of the department that they're in or the library environment that they're striving for. So um, context is uh, pretty important. Another characteristic of, of successful librarians in today's technical services environments is having a growth mindset. This is essentially um, the ability to identify both problems and to see solutions and not get stuck in the problem stage. Um, all of us are resistant to change, but having a willing, willingness to learn is critical when working in environments experiencing unprecedented change. 
I often look for folks who are willing to experiment and understand that almost every problem can become an opportunity. Uh, maintaining a positive, optimistic mindset while learning new systems and evolving workflows is also key. Um, often librarians are leading the way for staff who also need to learn these new skills. Um, positive framing of change is always helpful in reassuring staff um, to also grow in new directions. And excuse me for just a minute. Okay, I'm back. Emotional intelligence is one of those buzz phrases that folks are talking about and in just about any industry. From my perspective, I'm looking for folks who not only know how to do their job, but they also think about others. They prioritize relationships and they understand the impact of other stakeholders for accomplishing their own job. They also understand the various layers of the work environment whether those are the personnel layers, the administrative layers, the functional layers. <coughs> um, technical services staff are increasingly providing direct services to others outside the department. And this might be other library departments or even could be the university community, faculty or students. It's also important for technical services librarians to understand how to basically read the room and market their own value, especially as administrators think about uh, shrinking budgets and return on investment. Um, time management is one of those perennial qualities that every manager looks for. In an environment with changing standards, practices, systems, and workflows, you have competing demands and constantly changing priorities. So some people just have a knack for time management Others of us just have to work at it. Either way, you need a personal system for managing your time, your to-dos, and your deadlines. Um, for me, it really doesn't matter what that system is, just that the individual realizes they need it and that they've worked to develop a system that works for them. <laughs> Another quality I look for is self-awareness or an ability to objectively reflect on your strengths and weaknesses. Often this quality goes hand in hand with flexibility. If you understand how others perceive you, you can often make necessary adjustments to ensure a positive relationship or outcome. Folks who are self-aware usually understand how they affect and influence those around them. Um, in an environment where one is constantly expected to learn new skills, grow their level of responsibilities for both themselves and for others. It's also helpful if you're willing to accept constructive criticism without being offended. This is a tough one. I see it all the time uh, with the journal and uh, having to give people feedback about their articles, but folks truly do benefit when they can honestly assess where they need improvement um, with or without the help of others. <clears throat> One favorite question in an interview is whether you like to work in a team or alone. And this can be a tricky question as you really need to be able to do both to be successful. In terms of collaboration, I'm interested in someone who is willing to grow ideas with others, someone who understands the benefits of partnerships and can reach out to other experts, whether from another library or even across the country to talk out problems and solutions. You know, for many of us in technical services, we may be the only person at our institution who does our particular job. So sometimes in order to improve our processes or even to understand them, we need to reach out to others who have um, experience and uh, share. The idea of collaborative spirit also contributes to an individual's ability to function in a positive way um, within a team environment. On the flip side, you also want someone who can work independently to shape and evolve their job. Over the last decade, technical services have seen several new kinds of jobs, from electronic resource librarians to metadata librarians to data services librarians. In many cases, the supervisor of these positions may be able to provide some broad strokes and guidance for what the position should do, um, but that might be it. 
um, especially if the position is brand new. As a manager, I'm looking for someone who can independently evolve the purpose and direction of these kinds of positions. Likewise, I'm also looking for someone who can take larger ideas and concepts and break them down and provide effective follow through. One quality I definitely look for in new hires is comfort level of ambiguity. <clears throat> um, I'm interested in someone who can adjust quickly to change and has the capacity for iterative decision making. As our libraries change and adjust to meet new campus needs, our jobs should shift quickly as well so that we can support these needs. More and more often, technical services departments are moving away from production-based workflows where someone specializes in just a few tasks to integrated shops of staff who handle complex life cycles for materials of all types. The, this requires staff to be thinkers and problem solvers with increased analytical skills. Librarians in this space need skills beyond following policies and standards are in increasingly designing, adjusting, and building workflows and systems on really almost a daily basis. <clears throat> the last skill I'd like to mention is management capacity. This is not necessarily referring to <laughs> traditional concepts um, of running a department or supervision. And excuse me for just a minute. All right, I'm back. But in some cases, um, you know, running a department supervision may actually be true if you're in a small shop and even as an entry level librarian. Um, but rather, I'm referring to the set of skills for effective project management. So, another trend in technical services is a move to more short term project based work or services. This shift in the type of work requires planning, resource management, goal setting, and regular follow through. For new hires, I'm often looking for someone who leans towards these skills. If you don't have these in your back pocket, that's okay. Many libraries are beginning to make investments in building out project management skills um, at their um, local institutions. <clears throat> Here are just a few tips that might help you out in uh, an interview situation. Um, first, try to be yourself rather than what you think the interviewers want to see. Um, both sides, you and the library, want to determine if the other is a good fit. If the institution is not a good fit for you, you might be help happier elsewhere. Um, I'm often surprised when folks fail to reveal where their passions lie. This is almost always a good thing to do. Highlight your gifts with your answers and whatever you do, don't apologize or throw yourself under the bus. Be honest about your weaknesses in an objective way, but in a positive frame. <clears throat> Make sure you have a list of questions ready for each of your interview sessions. If you've done your homework before the interview, this should be pretty easy. You'll want to educate yourself about the institution, the department that you're interested in, recent initiatives or projects that are going on at that library. You'll also want to prepare a list of examples based on your work achievements in or outside the library field that align with the potential job requirements to share during the interview. This is really critical for building context for the interviewer. Um, for new librarians that may have mostly indirect experiences from outside of the field, Finally, there really are no wrong answers to interview questions. If you answer questions sincerely, this will simply reveal who you are as well as your passions and your gifts. <clears throat> so once you get the job, here are just um, a few pieces of advice to help you settle in. Some of these were mentioned earlier in today's presentation. Um, when you start a new job, think of yourself as an anthropologist. Watch, listen, and take notes. Remember that one of your first priorities is to acclimate to the culture of the organization. This is hard to do if you don't take the time to figure out that culture. Um, there's a book called um, Never Eat Alone, and I've always agreed with the strategy to use times like lunch and coffee meetings to expand your network um, or help to help you learn more about the organization. 
<clears throat> Likewise, um, be open to feedback from all members of the staff. Folks may not be at the same level as your position, but their years of experience are worth their weight in gold. It's easy when you start a job to get lost in the minutia and chaos of learning all this new stuff. However, make sure to carve out time with your supervisor to set both short-term and long-term goals, um, even if you're not exactly sure what those mean early on. This will help you begin to build a roadmap of where you need to focus your energies. Likewise, make sure to prioritize not only developing your competencies on the job, but who you are as a professional. So this is often where it helps to have a mentor that can help talk you through your options, such as professional organizations to align with, or developing ideas for getting into writing. Um, one key to effective professional development is synergy. If you're trying to solve a problem at work, think about an avenue to pursue that area, maybe in writing or service, and this is always a win-win for both you and your organization. Ultimately, that first year, you, you will really want to focus on building relationships, learning expectations for the job, and focusing on outcomes and deliverables. And all of these things will help you establish a strong foundation for your career. <clears throat> Finally, I want to mention a few additional considerations. Some of these are things to avoid or potential fail points. And let me just take another quick break. Okay, I'm back. The first is not paying attention to promotion and tenure requirements if you end up in a promotion and tenure shop. So if you find yourself in this kind of a setting, learn the requirements and start early. Again, this is an area where mentorship really helps. I've seen too many new librarians in a panic when they go up for their third review because of poor planning. Also, don't sweat the little things. Don't internalize or focus on the negative. Focus on solutions rather than getting stuck in the details or um, emotional squabbles. <clears throat> another, another thing, um, it's easy as a new um, librarian to isolate yourself, especially if your job is unique, and try to figure out ways to connect out. <clears throat> You're not just there for you. Think beyond yourself to how your role can help others. This will connect you to your team as well as the organiza organization's priorities. Um, another fail point is not aligning with the organization's goals and culture. I can't emphasize enough how important it is to align with culture. Um, this is a critical piece of your ability to succeed in any organization. Another consideration to keep in mind is the principle of positive intent. Always assume positive intent on the part of others. This is a hard lesson to learn, but will save you a lot of heartache and wallowing in negative energy. Um, you should also think about how to manage up. You should understand and exceed your supervisor's expectations. You should learn their communication preferences. Match that style, even if it's not your own. Um, if your supervisor is a detailed person, give them detail if they're a big picture. Learn how to synthesize your work in this way. Um, if you don't know the answer, ask and ask again. Be direct when you're unsure. Clarify expectations or confusion early on. And finally, diversity matters. <laughs> Some positions that you enter into are vision positions. Some positions are more doing positions. I, I really have found that you need both kinds of people on your team um, and that you need to engender a healthy dose of uh, respect for these different aptitudes. It's also important to avoid hiring people who are like you. Um, diverse staff will help you evolve in unexpected and positive ways, and don't be afraid to talk to your supervisor about things that you might disagree with that might advance um, your program or your team. Finally, um, there are many paths to success in our field. 
Hopefully you've learned today that there are many methods of support for you along the way. And that's all I have. Um, any questions for any of the speakers? All right, thank you. Thank you for our speakers. This is great. Okay, I think I do have one question that I think I should know, but I don't. Um, maybe Kimberly, do you know what NISIC stands for? <laughs> um, I it doesn't stand for anything specific anymore. It used to be an um, an act. I think it used to be North American Cereals Interest Group, but it doesn't stand for that anymore. It just is NASIG. All right, great. Okay. Um, okay. I also want to let you all know that um, people are asking about slides, so we will post the recording and also the slides on the NASIC website. So um, you can go on and download later. All right, here I see more questions coming in. Let me grab them. All right, so here's a question for Maria. Sorry, let's see. All right, so will there be more opportunities for new professionals? rather than students for mentoring, spotlight sessions, et cetera? So um, you're wanting to know if um, there are more opportunities for um, like presentations and that kind of stuff? Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Okay, so here, here's one for you, Maria. What okay. do you think is the best way to get library students interested in technical services? Because hmm. a lot of students think it's not cataloging for them. <laughs> <clears throat> well, that's a tricky one because I think a lot of library schools don't necessarily um, have a, a lot of coursework that will le lead you down that path. Really, I think um, internships, um, trying to um, pull people in um, from a practitioner point of view. Um, we've had success here at State with our fellows program. So people who've come through the program had, that have, that really thought they had no interest in tech services, then they get here and they participate in the fellows program and they're like, wow, you guys do all this stuff? Um, we've had a lot of luck with, with that kind of thing. So anything that will, allows you to provide um, more exposure to the kinds of work that you do um, you know, that it's, it, but that's, that's, it is a hard one to get um, folks into the, into the field. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Um, I have one question for Kimberly. Um, this is, grab the questions really quick, these things. Okay. So uh, will, there, will there be more opportunities for new professionals for mentoring, spotlight sessions, et cetera? Um, I do believe that NASIG is looking into how to expand the mentoring program um, outside of just students. So if you are a NASIG member um, and then are on the listservs and stuff, just keep an eye out for that. I don't know anything specific, but I think they're looking at that, especially with the um, assessment and feedback that they get from the current student mentoring program. Um, and then for the spotlight sessions, um, I do know for this year there are two um, session times called snapshot sessions, and um, they're very similar, and one is the student spotlight one, so it's only students, but there is um, at the conference a snapshot snapshot session time, which is a very similar thing for anybody to um, submit a proposal to do um, a five-minute presentation um, on different, you know, uh, category or whatever um, that they want to do a presentation on, and then that will be evaluated and um, or not. So there are um, other opportunities for uh, people that are not students. Um, there are some programs like that or different opportunities. Um, but that stuff is just, if, if, if anybody wants to email me, feel free and I can kind of help direct them in the right way. But if not, um, going on to NASIG's website is a really uh, good resource. And Yan, I just want to uh, speak up that um, Alex also, um, ALA Alex also has a mentoring program for professionals in any stage of their career. Um, and that's an, uh, the Alex organization supports 
um, collections people, technical services people, acquisitions people. So that's another um, uh, relatively new mentoring program. Okay. All right. I have a couple of mech questions here. Um, this one may be for Maria, I think. Do you have any field resources for professional development in technical services? And as uh, Maria, as you mentioned, you know, it's a quickly changing field and keeping up to date can be a bit, uh, you know, um, daunting. Yeah, yeah. so um, really for professional development and keeping up with trends, that kind of thing, mm -hmm. uh, um, I find that the easiest way to do that is, you know, professional reading, <laughs> you know, and if you have a project or a problem space that you're trying to solve or, or help, um, you know, when, especially I'm talking about people are like the first year on the job, um, that you have to solve that problem, you already have to do that research and that investigation, and often that is a really easy way <laughs> to sort of contribute to the field because if you're wanting to know the answer, somebody else is wanting to know the answer. There are lots of different ways that you can also just get um, easily involved in professional development. Um, um, there, you could do book reviews, you can write columns, um, you know, really if you contact any column uh, editor or even editor-in-chief, they're going to give you um, possible opportunities uh, related to their journal. And I'll just say that if you see someone that um, is responsible for a newsletter or a journal or whatever, these people are all really accessible. If you want to email them and talk to them and ask what opportunities might be there for you, they will get back with you. Um, so there's that. But um, <clears throat> in terms of a list of resources for what's up and coming today, you know, paying attention to the listservs, um, there's, you know, obviously the, the primary journals that are part of our field. Newsletters are really good. Uh, the Against the Grain publication is great because they do small little snapshots, um, you know, th those kinds of things. And often professional organizations will have um, uh, publications um, or professional organizations will have publications as well that have like small little sound bites or proceedings from these different uh, conferences that they host. All of those things um, will help you keep up with what's going on in the field. Okay, great. Um, I have a couple more questions here. Uh, so this one is saying, uh, what do you recommend for students are not finishing in the traditional spring semester? In terms of getting a job? I guess so, yeah. Um, well, really, um, I think uh, I think that's okay, actually. Um, a lot of people will post positions um, throughout the year. They're posting them when they're ready. And then um, you, know, you might have, a, there are a few that will go on and, and look at you, and then uh, they can hire you officially after you get your degree. That often happens in the spring, but <laughs> um, I don't see that as a problem. Usually there are positions that are readily available throughout the year. Um, so I think it's mm -hmm. um, probably more important to just keep, keep watching the job ads, keep watching the different job lists that, um, that you're aware of. You know, there's always the ones like the ALA jobs list and there's the Chronicle and those kinds of things, but <coughs> keep a watch on those things and their opportunities throughout the year. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, here's one more question about NISIG. So would you recommend the NISIG conference and membership for students interested in metadata librarianship in academic library? Yeah, I think so. I think it's really open for a wide field. NASIG is um, is is more than just serials anymore. It's for e-resources. It's access and discovery metadata. It's it's a huge realm, and um, I think that it would be a great opportunity for any student, especially if they haven't gone to a large conference. Um, this is a really good size conference to go to 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 get that feel as well and to find lots of different opportunities for different sessions on a wide variety of topics. Okay, great. Um, here's one, are librarians still being hired to catalog? And my libraries, the catalogers are all paraprofessionals. <coughs> 
Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> you know, it, it really depends on the organization. And a lot of times, you might need those cataloging skills, and what you're getting hired for is to manage cataloggers or managing manage batch cataloging processes. Um, even one of the things that we're noticing, for example, here at State, <laughs> we're beginning to do some experimentation and research into what does it mean um, for academic libraries to get involved in linked data. So where are we with all of that? You know, and, and in many ways we don't know, <laughs> but um, one of the things that we're realizing is that, you know, people who know st something about authority control, um, that that knowledge set really does contribute to their ability to understand concepts behind linked data. So it, it may be that that education you're getting and something very specific like cataloging um, is still relevant. It just may mean that when you get your first job, you're not doing exactly what you thought you would do, but we're finding that especially bibliographic um, description expertise really does translate and crosswalk to these other areas. Great. Um, all right, here's a comment and also a question here. This webinar is uh, here specifically for students, job seekers. Uh, would you consider having something similar for people in a hiring position, like how to write a job posting, selecting apply applicants for interviews, what to look for in an interview process? I guess that's for um, NASIC uh, Continuing Education Committee, this question is. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, if you have any interest in any topic, feel free to contact NASIC Continuing Education, and we can consider putting up these webinars for you. Uh, here, I still have a couple more questions. I know we have a few minutes left. Let's see. All right, so here's one. Um, does working as a paraprofessional after getting your master's degree make it difficult to move into a librarian position? Well, this is Maria again. Mm -hmm. um, it, re it really depends on where you are. So um, one of, some advice that I often give to folks, if you're working as a paraprofessional and you get your library science degree, what is it that you want to do with that degree? If you want a librarian position, try to find a librarian position, I'd say within the first year after you get your degree. Um, that's when you're very, you're the most marketable. Um, that might mean, I, I attended a session years ago at UNC Chapel Hill when I was a new library student, and we went and talked to this guy who was a faculty member, and he talked about academic faculty, and he's like, you know, often to be successful in that career, you often need to make, you need to move at least once. And I remember thinking that that was the oddest advice at the time. But I think what he's saying is you sort of, you need to be flexible about where you're willing to go. And that's hard. And if you're not flexible, if you need to stay in, you know, like you, you live somewhere and you love it, and uh, then and that's okay too. So I think it's just about making personal choices about what you want from your career. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, I think we can do maybe just one last question. Um, this is also about job search and interview things. Um, so do you have any suggestions for how to get insights into culture during the interview? Mm. Yeah. <clears throat> um, you know, pay attention to um, sort of uh, the happenings in the room. Um, you know, sort of body language and that kind of stuff. There's all that kind of stuff. Ask good questions, you know, ask questions that sort of get at culture, that get at um, organizational structure and why that structure exists. Um, ask about collaboration across the organization. Ask people what they like best about working there. And, you know, and you can ask them what they like least. They may not really give you a, a straight up answer, but be direct in answering those questions. Um, if you do your homework and you look at the organization, um, what they have on their website, the packet that you get, all of that kind of stuff, you know, begin to make a list of questions of things that you're wondering about, um, you know, and talk to people. You know, we, 
the library world is a small one. Call people that might have worked there. You can do information interviews. Um, a few years ago, we had a slew of people that just came to visit, and they were doing information interviews about who we were, what we did, how we worked. Um, you know, there, there are lots of different mechanisms um, to sort of research the organization that, that you're interested in. All right, great. I think we're running out of time right now. Uh, we probably still have like one or two questions. We uh, just uh, we probably don't have time to answer them today. But um, I will post the recording and also the slides. The slides will have all the speakers' contact information. So feel free to contact them if you have additional questions. Uh, okay, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. And we hope to see you at our next continuing education event. Thank you. Thank you.